Hi students, so this is the fourth short lecture that we're going to have in geography class this week. There will be two more before I'm finished, um, but I wanted to talk to you about the three subsistence strategies that we covered in the three prior uh, videos because all three of those uh, subsistence strategies still exist in the world today. Foraging is as a, solely as a subsistence strategy is not very common at all. There are some little island nations like in, uh, or not island nations, excuse me, island communities, very isolated like in the South Pacific and also in the Indian Ocean that um, are foraging societies. There are horticultural societies, a famous one in the Amazon and and Orinoco River Basin in, um, in Brazil, uh, in South America, uh, in Venezuela. Um, there are some, you know, famous ones there, and there are also some uh, famous pastoral societies that still exist today. The Maasai I mentioned specifically in the video that we had. However, in um, geography, we really, as a discipline, don't focus on those subsistence strategies really as um, legitimate, I guess I would say, um, because geography looks more at modern structures and the way modernism shaped the world. When I say modernism, uh, the next video that we're going to talk about is going to look at the first agricultural revolution, which doesn't sound like it's modern time at all, but it's very recent in human history. So um, it's modern in that, in that regard. Um, but, uh, you know, we are going to look a lot at at how agriculture changed completely the human condition and populations boomed because in foraging societies, as we discussed, it's small populations, intentionally small populations. When we get to the population boom that agriculture enabled to happen, we will start talking about problems that keep uh, keep a uh, population low or the natural increase rate low, even though the crude birth rate and the crude death rate are high. You've got so many people, you've got a lot of problems as far as uh, disposing of waste correctly so that people don't get sick and die early because of, you know, infectious disease spreading. Maybe some of you did the cholera video for the first um, discussion post. So you know how, you know, diseases can spread so easily among a large population of people. Um, uh, horticulture is not really highly valued in a money-making kind of capitalist uh, era, you know, corporation rule the world kind of situations because horticultural societies in general, are they're not interested in making a surplus and making money. They're just interested in being left alone and kind of managing their own situation. I did some work um, on uh, the Mexican Revolution and Mexican culture and history during my PhD program, which isn't finished yet. You don't have to call me Dr. T, just call me Mrs. T. But um, it was so interesting when I read and studied uh, the Mexican Civil War era, which is like 100 years ago, and Emilio Zapata was one of the leaders of, um, you know, the rights for a neglected population. And essentially, he was leading a a resistance for his agricultural, small-scale horticultural kind of communal cultural group who weren't really interested in changing their ways of horticultural or small-scale agrarian not-for-profit enterprises. They just wanted to have their community like it had always been, but the powers that were taking over the Mexican government wanted to force modernization and capitalism and um, money-making enterprises and land ownership, not just communal access to land, but land ownership and um, nationalism of, of things. So um, these ideas are not really modern, foraging and horticulture. Um, 
in pastoralism, for the most part, you see more of those societies. There's not very many, but you see more of those societies existing today. And honestly, it's because of the harsh environment comment when we were going over pastoralism. Um, this is an adaptation to the environment where the natural uh, climate, the weather patterns, etc., um, is not conducive to supporting agriculture, to su for supporting um, horticulture. There's not enough irrigation, there's not enough fertilizer that can make the soil um, something that you can produce uh, plants in. There's not enough naturally occurring plants for you to forage, um, but those herd animals can eat those grasses that the one month of rainy season makes grow and therefore they can eat that dry hay that it turns into after the, dra the rainy season dries up and that grass that bounced up out of the ground dries into hay you know, cows, goats, those kinds of things can eat that. Or mountain goats can eat like the, um, oh, what's it called? The, the lichen or the, uh, uh, the little uh, fungus things that grow um, on the side of rocks and things like that. So there's all kinds of animals in the animal kingdom that can benefit from the kinds of things that grow in harsh environments. But human beings have to rely on those animals to give us our food in order to be able to exist in those harsh environments for a long period of time and definitely as a settlement um, over time. So um, with industrialized agriculture, which we haven't gotten to yet, but with agriculture in general and certainly with industrialized agriculture with capitalism and the other economic systems that are focused on money making um, the harsh environments of the pastoralists aren't really economically feasible to want so um, they don't focus on that very much and they're basically left alone and left to exist without being forced to convert to some kind of surplus oriented subsistence strategy, such as agriculture, which is different than industrialized agriculture, which is, which is different than industrialism and is also different than the green revolution that we're gonna look at with that cultured meat and other laboratory created food um, that I mentioned briefly in a previous video. So um, we are ready to bounce forward in human history to the first agricultural revolution. And we're also going to look at from that point on up to um, the Middle Ages, you know, the 13th or the 1300s, the 14th century, um, the calamitous 14th century, as some historians call it, because of the plague that had to be endured. And we're gonna look at um, very famous economists about pop and demographers. Thomas Malthus is somebody that you've read about in chapter two. And we're gonna look at his theory about population control and the food supply and all that kind of stuff in agriculture. But I just want you to have um, kind of a cushion to sit on while you're learning about this agriculture stuff because in my experience as a teacher and I started teaching before I had any gray hair okay so my experience as a teacher tells me that a lot of you did not have a background in foraging did not have a background in horticulture or pastoralism maybe didn't even know it existed so that's why I wanted to spend those three short lectures explaining to you what it's all about. Um, please take cultural anthropology if you're more interested in those subsistence strategies because there's two or three weeks, at least when I teach it, uh, there's two or three weeks that we spend on it and, and look at the connection that it has with um, the economy and with gender roles because even though I've mentioned capitalism here and surplus oriented subsistence strategies like um, like agriculture as an economic thing, there is an economy um, that uh, called reciprocity that occurs in the other economic systems too, even though, or excuse me, the other subsistence strategies too, even though surplus is not a focus at all. So super interesting stuff. Um, I'm glad you're here with me. Text me with questions and I'll see you in the next discussion. Bye.